what we shall be doing today is to look at how another aspect of Smith's economics developed under his disciples, admirers, followers. This relates to a question which is largely left unanswered in Smith's writings. The question relates to stability, the long run stability in the market mechanism. Smith was confident that the vitality of the invisible hand, the market mechanism in which it was represented, he was confident that this vitality was unquestionable. However, he also visualized the possibility of sectoral disequilibria in the market economy, which simply means that some part of the market or other might be in a disequilibrium state almost all the time. The question that came up after Smith's time was whether these sectoral disequilibria were of such an order that they could destabilize the market mechanism in the long run. In other words, could these sectoral disequilibria develop into larger macroeconomic disequilibria. Alternatively, would it be possible for the sectoral disequilibria to cancel each other out and an excess supply in one part of the market would probably be countered by an excess demand in another part of the market. So, that over a period of time they might cancel each other out leading to some kind of a long run stability possibility. By the time Smith had finished writing or by in fact till the end of the 18th century there was no clear proof available to people to say whether there was such a long run possibility of stability. Proof either through deductive argument or through empirical information. Neither of these proofs existed for the possible hypothesis that market mechanism was endowed with an ability to remain stable in the long run. On the other hand, Smith himself appeared to entertain doubts. Smith himself appeared to entertain doubts about the possibility of such a stability in the long run. Jean Baptiste they say, one of the students, ardent students of Smith, reached way beyond Smith's own arguments to argue or to claim that there was not just a potential, but the actuality of long run stability in the market mechanism. The famous statement which went under the name Say's Law simply stated that it was impossible for the market mechanism to overproduce. The possibility of general overproduction did not exist. This must be viewed against the pessimism of Ricardo which we have noted earlier. Ricardo felt that it was always possible for the economy to overproduce 
excess supply. He went to the extent of foreseeing decline in the rate of profits in the long run in the market economy. We shall see subsequently that this argument of Ricardo is taken up very incisively, very thoroughly and in substantial detail by Marx. However, at this point in time, we have to look at J. B. Say, who argued that such possibilities did not exist at all, they were just not inconceivable. But in order to get there, Say made a couple of fundamental changes from Smith's original position. If you remember in Smith's theory of value, there was a certain ambivalence. On the one hand, there was labor theory of value, according to which all value in an absolute sense derived in the system from the effort entailed or the labor embodied in the production of something. So, the two notions, the labor that is entailed and the labor that is embodied as we have seen constitute one end of the spectrum of Smith's theory of value. At the other end, Smith was also to concede that labor alone did not constitute the value of things, the cost of production according to Smith was actually a composite cost. Smith was willing to and actually able to include the cost of other factors of production in the cost of production of anything. He was willing to take in the cost of capital, he was willing to take in the profit margins of an entrepreneur and so on and so forth in addition. So, that at one end of the spectrum when Smith was talking of cost, he was talking of only labor theory of value, at another end of the spectrum he was talking of a composite cost. Beyond all this Smith was also talking of the exchange value, the market price and the relationship between these two theories of value and how they were related to market ex exchange. This was something which was resolved or rather left unresolved substantially in Smith's writings. So, that you found one line of thought taking off after this through Ricardo and in the Malthus Ricardo debate, Torrens and others and eventually as I just now said ending up with Marx. The other direction of course, was to consider that there was a relationship between some long term stable prices which Smith called natural prices and the exchange value as it obtained in the market. So, Smith was also preoccupied with exchange value and trying to correlate it to something more absolute, more substantive, more enduring. What Jean Baptiste de Say did was to completely dispense with the notion of the absolute in theory of value of Smith. He simply dispensed with the idea that there should be or could be or would be any absolute determinant of values such as embodied labor and so on and so forth. In its place, say accepted 
that something like the exchange value of objects as prevalent in the market was a good enough index of its scarcity. In fact, in Smith, I am sorry, in Say, we find the beginnings of modern theory of the market. You have explicitly defined demand side an explicitly defined supply side, the demand side regulated by the utility of objects consumed and the supply side as consisting of composite cost functions determining supply. However, say admitted as did Smith the possibility of sectoral disequilibria, but was quite clear in asserting that these were passing, these were not permanent phenomena, these were not generators of long run macroeconomic disorder. His argument was very simple. He said the aggregate, aggregate value of all goods and services produced was the same as the aggregate incomes distributed to factors of production. After all, something is manufactured by factors of production and for the time that these factors of production spend in the process of manufacturing, they are paid, they are rewards. So, the sum of rewards or factors of production in the aggregate would be the same as the sum of the values of all goods and services produced in the economy. In other words, as and how something is manufactured, the very process of manufacturing generated purchasing power. As and how something was manufactured, as and how the manufacturing process went on, as and how the factors of production spent time in the manufacture, they had been, they were being paid for the time that they spent. So, manufacture was also generating purchasing power. This was a very lucid argument made by Say. But what does it lead to? Does it simply mean an identity saying aggregate demand? equals aggregate supply or is it simply an identity which means aggregate income generated is aggregate output. In short, was it just an identity that aggregate demand would be equal to aggregate supply? Say went much further, say went much, much further because he argued that it was not just generation of purchasing power and income, it was actually generation of expenditure. If I manufactured a thousand rupees worth of an object, I am also generating a thousand rupees worth of potential expenditure through that manufacturing process. Now, the big difference between what I am saying now and what Say did about the macro economy is that there was nothing potential about it for Say. For Say, the moment you manufacture the, the aggregate value of all things manufactured automatically guaranteed an aggregate expenditure of this much. In other words, the process of manufacture is not just generation of purchasing power but it was generation of effective demand. 
it is in this sense that John Maynard Keynes looking at say stated that according to say supply creates its own demand and of course, which later became taken up by all the textbook writers and I recall when I went to school when I was doing my economics in my ninth standard or 10th standard whatever. I remember uh, the teacher said what is say's law? Supply creates its own demand and that is how we learnt it which of course, it is not true because say's law had nothing to do with supply creating demand, but this is how it happened. So, the very process of manufacturing something guarantees effective demand. In sum, from an uncertain position of the long run fate of the market in Smith to an absolute certainty through this straightforward deductive reasoning by say in the form of say's law, it is impossible to have general overproduction. Of course, there is a substantial assumption underlying the process of manufacture guaranteeing effective demand. After all, manufacture is a particular time cycle and the rewards come at the end of the time cycle to the factors of production. I work for 10 days to manufacture something and at the end of the 10 days, I am paid for manufacturing that object or I continuously work in a factory manufacturing day and night objects and at particular periodicity I get paid my salary. Either way the time cycle of manufacture and the time cycle of the payment of rewards are not the same fine. Even if they are the same the argument still can be made that the money going into the pocket of a worker does not mean that he has spent the money. No? there is a lag, there is a lag between the process of earning and the process of spending. It is a lag both processually and in time. I could get my paycheck on a Saturday and might decide to spend part of it on the next Wednesday or a month later. Therefore, to be simply able to say that manufacture of, of the goods and services in the economy guarantees the effective demand for all these goods and services makes a big assumption. The assumption is that there is no lag between earning and spending, between the accrual of income and expenditure. You make that assumption, then you got says law all neat compactly worked out, but it is a big assumption. A lot of modern macroeconomics actually rests, yes please. You see time cycle of manufacture is basically determined by production conditions, technology yeah. right. So, that is exogenous to the process of earning. What I am trying to say is therefore, uh, earning has its own time cycle which is institutionally determined. Manufacture has its own time cycle which is technologically determined. So, to simply assume that manufacturing something creates effective demand makes, us, makes an assumption that the time cycles coincide. Second, that once earning comes, it is simultaneously spent. Hmm? So, a lot of modern macroeconomics is focused on this very problem. Anticipated expenditure, anticipated manufacture, if they are in equilibrium, then the economy is in one kind of equilibrium. But to merely say that all that is manufactured is based on 
some expenditure incurred by somebody is tautology, it is mere truism, it does not amount to a strong theoretical proposition. A lot of Keynes's economics rests on whether planned savings in the economy are equal to planned investments. The economy is in a state of macroeconomic equilibrium if these two things are equal, but there is no guarantee that they will be equal. So, the long and short of it all is there is a very strong assumption underlying says law and that is the absence of lags. However, says law was a very persuasive argument, so persuasive that at different points of time in the debate between Malthus and Ricardo, it was possible for one of them to cast it aside but both of them were strong believers. Ricardo was a very strong believer in says law and Malthus a bit of a doubter was so convinced about the power of says law that he did not question many of Ricardo's arguments which were based on says law because he himself accepted says law. It was some 3 to 4, no I think says law was somewhere in the second decade of 19th century. So, in the 6th, 7th decade I think I am not very certain at this point came the next phase of refining this argument. This was in the work of Leon Walroth, who was a member of the Luzanne school, was a professor in Luzanne, Frenchman, who created the mathematical foundations on which says law could be established beyond doubt. According to Walras, it was no longer a speculation, it was no longer excellent deductive work that aggregate supply and aggregate demand would actually be equal and there would be an equilibrium across the economy which Walras called general equilibrium according to Walras, it was possible to mathematically prove this. Once you guarantee perfect competition and once you guarantee perfect knowledge among the actors in the market, according to Waldorf, it was just a matter of mathematical derivation of the proof of the existence of general equilibrium. The standard way of going about this is to postulate an economy with factors of production market, with commodity market and to see how all the markets for factors of production and how all the markets for commodities attained their equilibria simultaneously. So, if you have if you can conceive of an economy with n commodities and m factors of production, then what do you have? You have n commodity demand functions, you have m factor of production demand functions which are simply stated in a very simple form you know d is f of p right. Whatever relationship between that you postulate between p and d, d is a dependent variable and p is the independent variable. So, as p moves along d changes as simple as that. So, if you have n commodities and m factors of production, you have n plus m demand functions in the market. 
Likewise, if you were to postulate a supply function such that S is f of p, then you can think in terms of n supply functions, n supply equations for commodities and m supply equations for factors of production. So, you can think of n plus m supply function supply equations. So, here is a simultaneous equation system where you have n plus m demand equations, n plus m supply equations, you have 2 times n plus m equations in the system. What are the unknowns? You have n commodity prices to find out, hmm? you have m factor prices to find out. So, you have n plus m equilibrium prices which are unknown in the system, which have to be solved for by the simultaneous equations. Likewise, you also have n unknowns which are equilibrium quantities of commodities. You also have m equilibrium quantities of factors of production. So, you have m plus n unknowns as equilibrium quantities. So, you have 2 n plus m unknowns in a system, where there are 2 n plus m equations and we all know and this is what Walras proved that if you have a simultaneous system equation system with equal number of equations and unknowns, there is a unique solution. The values for the unknown are obtained uniquely. So, this was as simple as what Walras did, I mean he did that, but you must understand that when Walras did that, nobody took it seriously. In fact, Walras was not taken seriously at all till the 1930s. I am told that in all the works of Marshall and he did create enormous amount of work, there are just three footnote references to what Walras did. So, uh, Walras himself did not write much, he did, he wrote two shortish books. Quite aside from the fact that He wrote this lovely piece of mathematical reasoning. Walras also thought of himself as a socialist. So, although economically, the, the economics which he produced was an economics of laissez faire, a free market with independent, perfectly knowledgeable actors. In his personal commitment, he was thinking of a liberal state which intervened in the economy in the interest of justice, in the interest of welfare, which is probably one reason why he was not as persuasive about what he said that people noted him immediately. Because if you look at what Say had stated and what Walras stated. You can see that Walras carried Say's argument several steps forward, much more rigorous, much more tightly argued. But as I said, it was not time for Walras to be noticed at that time. However, how did the Walrasian system work? The Walrasian system was like a big country market. There were vast number of buyers, vast number of sellers and the vast number of buyers who were also vast number of sellers. 
you know you go to a country market with your goods grown in your farmyard, sell them and try to get probably a piece of soap or uh, whatever else you know you need from other people's production. So, in the Walrasin market everybody was a participant as a buyer as a seller. And in this melee of such a large number of people all of whom are perfectly knowledgeable and perfectly rational of course, the market is orchestrated and managed by an imaginary auctioneer. Now, the auctioneer is the replacement for infinite number of negotiations which would otherwise go on all the time between all the buyers and sellers. So, to preempt the possibility of such infinite number of negotiations, which would create complexity in the system as well as which would take time, Walras assumed that there was an auctioneer. So, he like everybody else in the market was perfectly knowledgeable. So, he knows what had arrived in the market and what was wanted in the market. So, somebody said ok bananas. So, immediately the auctioneer would shout one price and immediately some would, they would say I am taking it, I am taking it, others would not take it. So, he would say ok there is more demand for bananas at this price than there is supply. So, he would hike the price, quote another price slightly higher, then the supply goes up a little bit, demand comes down, oh, then hike the price a little bit more till suddenly you find that at a particular price, all the people, all the demand for the bananas would be equal to all the supplies. So, equilibrium is reached not through individual negotiations. Equilibrium is reached not through some fiat, equilibrium is reached by the bidding in an auctioneering system. This process through which this auction occurs is an iterative process, corrective process. You see the auctioneer says 3 rupees a dozen and then people say oh 3 rupees I want all of it, then there is not enough, there are not enough bananas going. So, he may say oh no no 3 rupees is a bit too low, 6 rupees a dozen, then immediately the number of people who want the bananas are reduced by half, the number of people who want to supply bananas goes up by another half. So, he says ok now if I hike the price there seems to be some movement towards an equilibrium. So, he hikes it a little bit more and now and more till such time as an equilibrium occurs in the market. So, how is the equilibrium, how is the equilibrium decided equilibrium is decided through a process of iteration going back and forth making corrections self corrective process. Now, this process was called Tatonima by Walras. Tatonima is nothing but the French for this process of iterative adjustment. Mm -hmm. So, the auctioneer is one side of the Walrasian process. The other side is a very peculiar entrepreneur. Now, what does an entrepreneur do in business? Who can tell me? Akhil? Okay, and so then that's where the innovation comes. Once they see the profit opportunity, there will be innovation and production. Can't an entrepreneur not innovate but just put factors of production together? Mm, good, he's a risk taker, he puts factors of production together, he's innovating. So, that's quite a lot of work. And what does he get in return for this? Profit. 
lovely. So, so you have different factors of production getting different rewards. So, the investor gets his interest, the worker gets his wages and so forth and entrepreneur gets his profits. Now, when the firm is showing profits, what would an entrepreneur do? Continue to produce more, employ more factors of production. He would expand, expand production. Expand production. Isn't it? Mm. So, the firm is showing negative profits, which is loss. What would an entrepreneur do? Cut back production. So, when there is profit, there is excess demand or a profit occurs due to occurs due to excess demand is not it losses occur due to excess supply. So, in a Walrasian system there can be neither profits nor losses in equilibrium. In equilibrium profits will always tend to 0 is not it because if there are profits then there are different firms which will expand. If there are losses, then there are other firms which are contracting. So, profits and losses can occur only in sectoral disequilibria, but when the whole economy simultaneously is resolving, there can be neither profit nor losses. Profits have to be 0, no, because every market is in equilibrium. Hmm? So, one of the unique things about the Walrasian system, general equilibrium, is that profits always tend to 0. Hmm? The question remains profits tend to 0, why are there entrepreneurs? No, can somebody answer that? He, if he, he, there may be like for example, this, this is a long run profit is equal to 0 condition, I mean, but in the short run there will be you know a cycle or you know where uh, an opportunity for profit basically there, in, there will be moments for that and in the short run. Here it also seems like the economic profit uh, will tend to zero, but there might still be an accounting, accounting profit. profit. How? Uh, Walrasian system is an accounting system. That's true. Sir, lots of times uh, the investor and entrepreneur they are the same. So, the interest that they are that they earn on capital nice. that, so that, will, uh, that, that will be their profit. They probably have a premium interest to do all the other things like taking risk and all that. Okay, that is one explanation and Aditi has another explanation which is? That uh, the profit is even though it is a very long run kind of a, mm. you know, this thing. So, in the short run people are always looking to profit. Uh, there might be opportunity for profit in the short term. There will be the moments of excess uh, demand or excess supply. Though in the long run, there might not be such an excess demand con continuously, but in the short run, there might be an opportunity for such a. Thing. Anybody else? If not, then I will ask a question. Is there a long run in Walrasian system at all, if it is simultaneous? If all the markets are resolving simultaneously, in fact there is no time, there are no time lags in the system at all, no, it is 0. There are two exceptional assumptions in the Walrasian system. One is perfect knowledge among the actors and other 0 time all markets resolve simultaneously, not one after another, not one just behind the other, no, they are happening together simultaneously. So, all this bidding and counter bidding and all the quotations and re quotations in the process which is known as Tatonima, that process involves no time, it is only a logical process, it is not a it is only a virtual process, it is not a real process. Am I not right Aditi? If that is the case, how
how can there be a long run in Walrasen system as distinct from any short run? No. So, it is not the I mean I would I would accept what you say if the Walrasen system had some provision for time. Absolutely. So, there is there is no long run then why are there entrepreneurs? One is of course, that he entrepreneur could be a capitalist, but then he would not be called an entrepreneur then, he would be a capitalist. Avantika had something to say, you forgot, I forgot what you said as an explanation. Speculating? Yeah. Okay. So, why are there entrepreneurs? And as far as I can see, was it a sort of an exchange economy sort of thing? It is, it is a perfect exchange economy. So, in which case, an uh, entrepreneur would produce uh, in order to uh, get revenue to spend on other. Everybody in the world in economy is doing huh. that. Yeah. Everybody so is a buyer and a seller. Huh, which, is, which explains the existence of all. Why? How can, I, how can I buy anything if I have zero income? Which is why you need, uh, for the purpose of income, exists the other. Profit way. opportunity is like, for example, um, starting off in an exchange economy, you will see that uh, you may notice that a person wants, uh, say, a commodity X, and you see an opportunity there and you produce that X. Uh, so because you will make profits, is not it? Why should you make X unless it promises profits to you? No? And then I am saying the system does not give you profits, then why should I do these things? No, but it gives wisdom that can be used to procure why. Does the answer lie in what economics? Is, uh, sorry? Does the answer lie in economics or is it? Oh boy, no, absolutely. That is a stunning, that is a stunning remark. I will right now not react to that, but it will come in a couple of minutes. Absolutely. Now, um, as far as I can see, there is no way, Avantika, anybody would go into any business if he is told there is nothing in it for him. So, whether he can get something else later, something that assumes time. So, if there is no time, if there is no reward, fundamentally the question is why am I at it? I must, I must be either crazy or some kind of a mendicant who with no desires at all. Right? This is one big question about the Walrasian system. The most central part of the economy, the most key player in the economy, the entrepreneur has no rewards and he is still at work. So, the motivations for the entrepreneur are completely not explained in the Walrasian system. That is art. Why he should be doing what he is doing is not explained at all in the Walrasian system. So, there are two unique things about the Walrasian system one, the auctioneer and the entrepreneur who has no motivation to be an entrepreneur, but he is still there. No? In modern times, the application of Walrasian economics is massive. One of the most interesting applications of Walrasian economics in a large context is what happened in the case of India between 1970s or through the 70s and 80s, there was an attempt, continuous attempt by eminent Indian economists to work out a computable general equilibrium model as the basis for planning in India.
the CGE modeling as it is called became a very major branch of economics and more importantly as a branch of planning. The planning commission was engaged for several years in creating small and large CGE models. Eventually, there was substantial work done in the CGE area for both the previous five year plan and the current five year plan. As you can see, such an attempt begs a lot of questions, but I think it was a matter of substantial courage that the economists in India picked up the challenge and decided that work on a CGE modeling exercise for planning in India, which needed enormous number of supportive assumptions, supportive database which happened. I do not know of very many countries in the world which undertook such a large scale exercise of general equilibrium analysis in order to plan for their economy. I do not know if socialist countries did that, but certainly India did. So, that is about walrus in economics. As you can see that walrus carried says work much, much further. And more importantly, his work actually came as an alternative paradigm, which became, which economists became aware of it only much, much later. It came as an alternative paradigm to a lot that happened after his time in partial equilibrium analysis. What is partial equilibrium analysis? Can somebody tell me? Analyzing the different models. Absolutely you assume that there are separate economic actors and you study the behavior of separate economic actors in the marketplace. Yes, by now you know all of your microeconomics is partial equilibrium analysis. Hmm? It is a fascinating question that came up for syllabus makers. I remember in the 1970s in Delhi University. Uh, where to include general equilibrium in the syllabus? Should it be included in microeconomics? Because you are talking of n number of markets and m number of markets, individual actors, or should you be talking about general equilibrium as a part of macroeconomics? If you did that, then you would not be talking of blocks of economic actors like you the block of consumers, the block of savers, the block of investors. That is happening in conventional macroeconomics, but generally equilibrium does not do that. So, it is a big problem in those days. Of course, they resolved it very interestingly, they managed to include it in microeconomics. Uh, but still, you know, microeconomics as we know it is not is not general equilibrium, it is partial equilibrium analysis. The point I am trying to make is all of Marshallian, Pigovian, Javancian economics, Edgeworthian economics, all of it is partial equilibrium partial equilibrium and it is only Walrus's work which was general equilibrium. So, in times to come people were to look for areas where general equilibrium analysis would enable a better idea of optimum utilization of resources and welfare and so forth, but it took the efforts of Pareto, an Italian to show that when there is a general equilibrium, there is a maximum welfare in the economy. So, general equilibrium became very important to welfare economics as it developed subsequently. It became important for economists to show when do you attain maximum welfare in a market economy, when there is general equilibrium. So, a lot of tools developed in welfare economics and in general equilibrium trying to tie up assessment of economic welfare through general equilibrium analysis. We break for now and meet after the break.